But then the queen looked up and saw Gaijis concealed in the shadows. And although she said nothing, she shuddered. And the next day, she sends for, for Gaijis and challenged him. And hearing his story, this is what she said. Off with his head. <laughs> <laughs> she said, either you must submit to death for gazing on that which you should not, or else kill my husband who has shamed me and become king in his place. So Gaijis kills the king, marries the queen and becomes ruler of Lydia for 28 years. The end. Welcome to Very Old Money, a podcast that looks at history through money. Episode 2.1 Lydia and the Birth of Western Coinage. A quick announcement before we begin I'm going to group my episodes as seasons, and I will place the total number of each episode in parentheses before the title. Since I plan to jump about a bit, this should make it easier for me to group seasons on the same topic and theme together. So say if I come back to Lydian coinage in a later episode, I can just group it with the season so down the road people know which episodes are grouped together. That is the plan right now. Let's see how this works. The coins listed on the cover art today are from Classical Numismatic Group, LLC, and you can view their site at www.cngcoins.com. Once again, I'm very grateful for their assistance in providing me the images for this podcast. So let's go on with the show. In the 12th century BC, the Hittite Empire of North and Central Anatolia abruptly collapsed. Anatolia is also sometimes referred to as Asia Minor, and is what is now the continental landmass of Turkey. The Hittite Empire had been declining for a while, with its eastern borders under threat from a rising and resurgent Neo-Assyrian Empire. But when the collapse happened, it was abrupt, and the Hittite capital itself was burned down around 1180 BC. The fall of the Hittites is part of what is sometimes called the Bronze Age Collapse of the Eastern Mediterranean when a number of states in the region collapsed under an attack of an unknown group of invaders, sometimes called the Sea Peoples. Only Egypt, under its last great pharaoh, Ramses III, drove off the invaders after two pitched and bloody battles. But exhausted, Egypt itself fell into a long decline in the aftermath of these invasions. One of the peoples who brought down the Hittites were the Phrygians. Now, the origin of the Phrygians has been disputed. Herodotus identifies them as migrants to the region, and there's some recent scholarship that has questioned whether that is actually true. And then there's obviously a debate if that is not true, who are the Phrygians and how do they fit into the Hittite Empire? But based in central and western Anatolia, with its capital at Gordian, the Phrygian kingdom was soon a power in the region and was actually encroaching on the Assyrian Empire in the east. The king Midas of legend, the one whose touch turns everything to gold, was a king of Phrygia. According to one of the myths, when he despaired of his power to turn everything to gold, he prayed to the god Dionysus and begged to be delivered from starvation because anything he touched turned to gold. Dionysus heard his prayer and told him to wash in the river Pactolus. As a result, this power of turning things to gold was transferred to the river. And as a result, the river sands themselves turned into gold. Now, this is the myth that was later used to explain why the river Pactolus was so rich in gold and electrum, the material that will be used to provide the first coinage in the region. There are three kings named Midas in the Phrygian kings list. The one on whom the legend has been based has obviously not been convincingly identified. According to classical historians, the last king of Phrygia was also named Midas. He committed suicide around 695 BC, when his kingdom collapsed under the attack of the Sumerians, 
a steppe people who also gave much grief to Assyria at the same time. King Midas supposedly committed suicide by drinking bull's blood. Now, bull's blood itself is not toxic, but it's often been mentioned in ancient sources as a poison used by many classical figures to commit suicide. So what exactly they were drinking is something that's obviously a matter of speculation. The Cimmerians themselves were eventually driven out by the other Anatolian power player that was rising in the region, the Kingdom of Lydia. Lydia had its capital at Sardis, and they spoke a now extinct Indo-European language from the Anatolian family tree called Lydian. The writing system is alphabetic and it may be related to Greek and eventually it was written from right to left. Unfortunately, much of Lydian mythology is lost because we have not found architectural monuments which have many inscriptions on them. And so when we look at Lydian history and Lydian mythology, we often relate, rely heavily on Greek sources. And particularly, we come to the aforementioned Herodotus, who is sometimes called the father of history, and who is the source of the story at the beginning of the episode, which is from the English patient. Herodotus gives us three dynasties in his list of Lydian kings, and Gyges, the one in the English patient clip, founded the last one. The last dynasty is almost certainly historical, but we do not know the exact dates at which they ruled, and so that's a matter of conjecture. We have dates assigned by Herodotus, but we have no real independent way to confirm them. According to Herodotus, since Gyges basically came to power in a military coup, he faced some resistance to his rule at the very beginning, and so he used the oracle at Delphi to sanctify his rule. And to get a favorable ruling from the oracle, he sent along a bunch of gifts. And the oracle complied and confirmed him as the rightful king of Lydia. It also stated that the house of Gyges would fall in the fifth generation. And now this has all the hallmarks of an ex post facto prediction. Gyges and his heirs spent a lot of their time fighting the Sumerians, who are still a problem. Gyges himself seems to have fallen in battle against them. The most successful ruler of the House of Gyges, sometimes called the Mermnad dynasty, was Aliates, who rules approximately from 610 to 560 BC. And again, these dates are a matter of conjecture. Aliates came to power at a time of another cataclysmic change in the Middle East, namely the collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were the big bully of the region for the previous three centuries. They had repeatedly crushed Babylonia, Elam, and even invaded Egypt. But in 612 BC, an alliance of the Babylonians and a new power in the region, the Medes, rose up, defeated the Assyrians, and sacked the capital of Nineveh, which itself was left to ruin. Three centuries later, a Greek army wandering in the region had no idea what the city was when they stumbled across the ruins of Nineveh. In 609 BC, Assyria itself was wiped off the map. Aliates and the kingdom of Lydia themselves went to war with the Medes. And this was caused by the Medes pushing west and the kingdom of Lydia pushing east. And this war ended with the indecisive battle of the Halys River in 586 BC. According to Herodotus, the battle was interrupted by the sudden occurrence of a total solar eclipse that both parties saw as an omen. The eclipse evidently had been predicted by the philosopher Thales of Miletus years before. And with the gods themselves giving a sign, Lydia and Media both came to terms. As part of the peace treaty, Aliates married his daughter to the Median crown prince Astyages, son of King Cyaxares. The halus itself was fixed at the eastern border of the kingdom. This was not the only war Aliates waged in his long reign. He also went to war with the Sumerians and he finally drove them out of Asia Minor and the Sumerians soon disappear off the record. He also went to war with a bunch of Greek cities on the coast of Asia Minor, sometimes called Ionia, and he subdued many of them, though he ultimately made peace with the city of Miletus. A map of the Lydian Kingdom is available in the post about this episode on veryoldmoney.com. Aliates is often listed as the ruler who introduced coinage, but that again is a matter of conjecture. 
The first issues might actually have started under his father, Sariatis. However, by his reign, the first coins were almost certainly circulating. And the Lydians were not necessarily doing this in isolation. The Greek cities of Ionia may also have been experimenting with coins at the same time. Lydia was rich in Electrum. By this time, Lydia had taken over what was once the Phrygian kingdom. And although King Midas of legend probably had nothing to do with this, there is a lot of Electrum in the area. Electrum is a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver. It is harder than gold, and this can make it more desirable as a metal for coins. Unfortunately, the people accepting these coins don't have any way of knowing just how much gold there is in this. Archimedes and his Eureka moment regarding density is still a few centuries away. The amount of gold in naturally occurring electrum can vary, and the amount of gold in electrum found in Western Anatolia is somewhere between 70 and 90 percent. However, Lydian gold coins are generally consistently about 55 percent gold, and about the rest of the 45 percent is mostly silver and there is some copper. The silver, as I said, makes the coin harder. The copper gives the coin a slightly more golden touch compared to natural electrum, which is generally whiter. It looks white in comparison to to gold. But the fact that the gold proportion in Lydian coins is lower than the amount of gold in electrum shows that the Lydians had got the technology to modify the gold content from electrum and reduce it to 55%. The weight standard of Lydian coins appears to be the stator of Miletus, which is about 14.1 grams. However, we have no full stator weight coins from this period. The largest known coin is the weight of a third stator. So it's approximately 4.7 grams and is referred to as a trite for one third of a stator. Again, we don't actually know what the denomination of this coin was. Uh, the name that has been given is based on the weight of what we know was a weight standard of a stator. The value of a trite in antiquity is debated. It may have been about one month of salary. The size and shape is irregular, but what is important here is not the shape, but the weight. And we have a weight standard and multiple denominations. As I said, the, it starts with one third of a stator, and then you got one sixth, one twelfth, one twenty fourth, one forty eighth, and then even one ninety sixth. This is about 0.15 grams, so really, really small. Now, some of these small denominations are not easy to tell apart. So, what probably is happening is instead of counting in individual coins in transactions, they were being weighed together. The first motif on these coins was a roaring lion head facing the sun. Later coins had confronting lion's heads. These coins are not yet two-sided. The obverse die with the image of the lion is, on, lion is only on one side. On the other side, you have an incused punch, which is what was used to force the flan onto the obverse die. The lion is generally held to be the symbol of the Lydian state, and it sort of acts as a state seal confirming the authenticity of the coins. There are also electrum coins with boar's heads on them. Now the boar's head, the winged boar, would later be the symbol of the city of Miletus, uh, Miletus, but these coins appear to be Lydian. The first coins were anonymous, but two legends are known on these coins. One of them is the name Kukalim, which may translate to I belong to Kukas, Kukas in Greek could be translated to Gyges, but these coins were almost certainly issued long after the death of King Gyges. The other name found on these coins is Valvet, which could be translated transliterated into Greek as Aliates. Now, the numismatist Robert Wallace has shown that these coins probably circulated at about the same time. And he's based this on the punch link between the hectai, which is like which is the what we call the one six staters, with the Kukalim legend and those with Walvet. And also comparing the signs of wear and damage on these same punches between these two series. And so based on this, Wallace has made a very persuasive argument that these coins are probably contemporary. So we don't know exactly who these people on these coins are. It is possible Walvet was Aliatis, but 
that is conjecture. The people on the coins don't necessarily have to be the king. It could be a provincial governor. It could be an official whose stamp on the coin is additional evidence of the coin's authenticity. In this early stage of coinage, putting the king's name may not have been a big deal. And as we go through this podcast, there'll be many periods where the king's name never actually appears on the coin. And in later periods, provincial governors and satraps often minted coins with their own name on it. So this is not unusual. So again, we have no idea who these two people are. So in the cover art for today's show, and you'll see it on YouTube and also on the website, I have six coins. Again, all of these are from CNG. The coins at the four corners are trites, one-third staters. The one on the top left is from the earlier style with the roaring lion facing right. The top right is an example of the Kukulim trite. And Kukulim is written in a retrograde script between the facing lines. The bottom left is an example of the Valvet coins. And again, Valvet is also in retrograde. But the facing line is off the flan. And this is, again, not uncommon in coins. The die was often bigger than the flan. And there's some speculation as to why this was. This may be a way to control control forgeries. We don't know. But this is an example of that. And the bottom right is another trite, but this one has a face of a boar. And we know from another coin example that there would have been a facing boar on the other side. The boar itself has very prominent tusks. But, as I said, the facing board is missing. In the middle are two coins, which luckily for me we have photographed together. So you can get to see somewhat a comparison of sizes. The coin at the top is a 1 6th stator, which is sometimes called a hectare, which is about 2.33 grams. Now trites are generally 13 millimeters. The hectares are generally smaller at 10 millimeters, but that's not a huge difference in just size. The weight obviously is half. And the other coin is a 124th stator. It's much smaller. It's only 6 millimeters and only 0.59 grams. Now the Hecte, the 16 stator, has the four part of a lion facing left and it has two square incused punches on the reverse. One has a stellate pattern and the other one has a bird facing left, possibly an eagle, but that's, again, we don't know. And the 124th stator has a boar head facing right and it has an incuse square punch. Now the interesting thing about these two coins is that the punch on the 124th stator and the left punch on the 16th stator, the hecte, are from the same die. And it is from these sort of die links we are able to connect various coin hordes and coin types and trace the evolution of coinage. The other thing you can note is the trites and the hectares, which are slightly bigger, have two incused punches on the back. The smaller coin has just one. The earliest known hoard of Electrum coins was found by the British Museum when they excavated the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus in 1904 and 1905. The Temple of Artemis itself is one of the seven wonders of the world, according to Herodotus. The hoard itself had 19 coins, which were placed in a small pot and buried and buried alongside another 74 coins in the foundations of the temple. Now, the intrinsic value of the electrum, even in the smaller denominations, is probably too high for daily transactions. And so none of these coins have ever been found in the excavations of the marketplace at Sardis. These were probably used for money transfers, whether whether major mercantile transactions to pay taxes, pay mercenaries, or to make donations for religious organizations. So the hoard found in the Temple of Artemis is likely, likely an example of the last. So moving back to the history, when Aliades died, there was an uneasy balance of power in the Middle East between the kingdoms of Babylon, Media, Lydia, and Egypt. In just one generation, this balance would be shattered by a boy who, according to legend, was raised as a shepherd, and it's possible he was a great-grandson of Aliades. So on the next episode, we'll get to that story, and the story of Lydia will come to its culmination along with a major development in coinage. So see you soon.
in He Shall Destroy a Mighty Empire. 